Jared Poland Frono's photo. Dot com and this is a first impressions video after having the Nikon Z9 for a week and being able to shoot in the real world in just about every situation that I could imagine to test out the Z9 in. The first thing I did was I photographed a college basketball game. That was a lot of fun. Then I drove an hour and a half to go to Conowingo Dam down in Maryland where there's supposed to be a lot of eagles flying and there, there weren't a lot of eagles flying, but I got enough footage and enough photos so you could see the autofocus in action. Then I did two concerts. One where the backlight was okay, but there was no front light. And then the next night I got to shoot a better concert lighting situation where the lights were exquisite, which is really what you need. So how this is going to work is I recorded my EVF like I always do, but because it's a Nikon, you can see all the focusing points in action while I am actually shooting. So you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing while shooting. Now I want to reiterate, this is a full production unit. Before we had a pre-production unit where Nikon set up a bunch of different shoots in conjunction with me and they were here and we did the shoots and we were pretty much happy with the results that we got and I'll just lead off with saying that I'm more than happy with the results that I got with this camera in multiple situations. Of course there's going to be some quirks, there's going to be some places where the Canon and the Sony would have performed better, but there's also some things that the Nikon does better that Sony and Canon kind of need to adapt or or sorry, adopt or copy or emulate. So let's start off with basketball. So what I'm gonna do now is show you a bunch of clips from the EVF for the basketball situation and then we're gonna come back and talk about my findings. So that's real world. It doesn't get any more real world than going to Drexel University to photograph the men's basketball team in action. Now, one of the cool things that you may have noticed is that it said F2 for some of the photos. That's because I was using a 200 millimeter F2 version one adapted with the F to Z version two adapter. One of the photographers there also shot Nikon and he said I could use his 200 F2 for a couple of minutes and it was great. I just love shooting with prime lenses. Now, you might question how good is the autofocus when adapting a version one lens. In this situation, I think it kept up really well uh, in conjunction with the autofocus. Was it as lightning fast as I would expect from a native lens? And the answer is no, but it didn't cause me to miss things that I thought I shouldn't have missed. Now with that being said, the autofocus seemed to bounce around uh, it was a little more erratic than I would have expected. Uh, the Canon and the Sony seems to be able to lock on the subject and stay there longer. Now, where you'll notice this is with the Nikon, I changed it to level five of stickiness. You don't have a lot of options when it comes to autofocus to tweak in the menu system like you do with the Canon. You honestly don't have a, a, a lot to tweak with the Sony in the A1 as well, but I went to the stickiest, meaning I wanted to stay on the subject and not be distracted distracted by anything just passing. So what the Nikon did, it, it, just, it just seems like it bounces around quite a bit. It's on the subject, then someone runs by and it grabs them, and then it bounces back to them. It's kind of all over the place, and I would like to see them tweak it so that it's stickier on the subject and doesn't get distracted. Case in point, we've got this basketball player dribbling up the court, and it's 
right where it needs to be the autofocus. As soon as he passes the ball, and we can go frame by frame here, it actually tracks the ball. Now that's not what I wanted it to do, but I do want to give props to the Z9 for literally getting that in focus when it's on the edge of the frame. The fact that it was able to track the ball, which is being passed, and have that in focus is good. Except I didn't want the ball in focus, but I did want to point out that positive. Now, back to the stickiness thing, we use the Canon R3 quite extensively and have a lot of footage to show where it's sticky on the subject because there's a lot of different cases. You can actually change the size of some of the focusing boxes to make it just look in this area. Like you can literally spread it across the whole frame along this line and that's where it's gonna look for the focus and keep everything in there. It's just more sticky. You have a better opportunity to lock onto the subject and even if something gets in the way, you don't lose it. That's not saying that the Nikon did a bad job. I'm happy with the results that I got from the colors to the tones to mostly the clarity. And you're gonna see at the very end of this, I'm gonna go over all of the images. But the other clip that I do wanna point out from this is when I use the 51.2 shooting at 1.2, Look, everything's out of focus right now. I'm not focused on anything. There's a, a block shot and then a quick break back the other way. The player's already coming towards me when I start to focus and it grabs it right where it needs to grab it. It was lightning fast. And the only time it loses him is when the ball goes in front of his face. Of course, what's, it's not gonna be able to see the eye at that point. So the next couple of photos, the, the keeper shot is good, right? When you zoom in on it, and you'll see this when we go over it later, it's. I'm gonna say good enough, like where if you need to look this hard to see if it's tack sharp at one, two, then you're looking too hard and it's probably perfectly fine. And the cool thing is I basically got run over, so that's why I go backwards and the, the camera's kind of pointing to the sky, but I don't mind getting run over because the guy helped me uh, back up. But I think it did really well with that 51.2, which is nice to say that at 1.2, it was able to track the subject. I will say it does feel slightly quicker uh, on an R3 when you use their 51.2, and the Sony 51.2 on the A1 definitely does seem a little faster. But at the end of the day with the basketball, very happy with the results. Camera felt great in the hands, super snappy, super quick. Uh, very happy with that. But birding, a lot of people were like, Jared, you should go photograph birds. So I didn't go to the zoo this time because I went into the real world and I went to Conowingo Dam, like I said a little earlier, and I took the 600 F4, which was adapted. I borrowed that from Alan's camera. It is the latest edition 600 F4. And guess what happened when I was there? What happened, Steven, do you know? What? What? Uh, there weren't a lot of eagles flying. Uh, I showed up before sunrise and I stayed till about 10.37 and there was maybe one or two flyovers from eagles. But there were seagulls flying around, there were other things to photograph. So let's run those clips right now so you can see the camera tracking the subjects. I was in 3D tracking, which is the mode that I like personally using. I didn't go into the one that's all encompassing. That is something I would like to test out in the final review that we do. So you can see the difference between 3D tracking or the one where you don't even have an active box and the camera just picks what it's supposed to focus on. So Steven, run those clips.
so I was happily surprised to see that the autofocus tracked across the screen. It wasn't a problem at all. It acquired the subject, and then if it was erratic and near the edge of the frame or back into the frame, it did a really good job. Now, what I'll say is with the adapted lens, I don't feel that it's as fast. I literally can hear the focus motors moving. It's not a bad thing. I don't care that I can hear the sound. That just means that it's moving. Uh, and it, th there's no native 400 or 600 Z lens yet for the Z system. Canon has a 400 and a 600, and Sony has a 400 and 600. So if you're adapting your F mount lenses to this, your big ass glass, it's going to work, but I do find that it just doesn't feel as hyper-focused as I would wanna be, because it's just, the type of motors that were in these lenses just feel slightly slower than when you adapt an EF lens to an R5, an R6, or an R3. I just feel that the Canon lenses adapt much better and are much faster focusing. They have a different focusing system. That's for adapted lenses. But I was able to get the results. I was able to get pictures. What I mean by that is I was able to get pictures that I was happy with. Now, look at this clip of it tracking the blue heron across the water. Uh, I didn't acquire it right away. I already got it. it. It caught my eye while it was in flight. I just moved the point over to where I need to move the camera, pointed it where I needed it to be, and it tracked the blue heron across the frame. And I took a bunch of images. And yes, they're not all in focus, but it's like five or six in a row are in focus, and then one might be off on the background just a little bit. And that's the same thing that would happen with a Sony or a camera. When you're taking 20, 30, 40 pictures, if a couple are out, but the next bunch are in, that's perfectly good. They all do the exact same thing. So it tracked that, and that's a bird just going straight across. But with this clip, you can see that it, I think it's the seagull going to the edge of the frame, and then kind of leaving the frame, and then coming back into the frame. And the fact that the, the focusing system can do that now means that it's really close to the Sony, and it's really close to what the Canon is doing. Now, at a distance, when there were a bunch of birds flying, the ones that actually form a heart right here, I actually like that photo, no camera is gonna be able to select a bird at that distance and be able to use the bird IAF or head AF. It's just super far away, but I'm really happy with that picture that I got there. And the last thing about the birds is 600 millimeters is kinda not enough for, for most of the stuff I was doing there. I did throw the camera into DX mode a couple of times just to see what it would look like. You're cropping it down, so you're probably at like 24 megapixels instead of 45. Uh, that's up to you. The question is, are you better off cropping after the fact or are you better off going into DX mode? Which one's gonna be better? I'm not really sure. Uh, I just would prefer saying crop versus DX, but a lot of people like seeing it right in the viewfinder. Let me jump in here real quick because I wanna show you this photo taken with the Nikon Z9 and edited with Fro Pack 3, starting with Fifth Element. Then we're gonna go down to Almost Famous, and that looks really cool. But check out Canadian Tuxedo. I was like, wow, that looks awesome, followed by Capone, and then we've got November Rain. But check this out from Fro Pack 1. We've got Silver Tide. That's right, Walt was in Silver Tide. That was his band, Silver Tide. Then we've got Kensington. That looks incredible. Followed by Cookies and Cream from Fro Pack 1 is awesome. Then we got Color Boomify, which I absolutely love for concerts, and Black and White Boomify, which I absolutely love for concerts as well. So if you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or you would like to give yourself a great starting point, we created 15 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are still on sale. Or if you want to get Fro Pack 1, 2, and 3 as a triple play bundle, you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. Moving on to the concert situations. Concerts are a, a, a great place to test out these cameras. One, because you're generally pushing the ISO, and two, the Nikon does not have a shutter. It also does not offer you variable shutter speed options. You can't set it like the Sony and the Canon to 1 580th point threeth of a second. You can't do that. You just have flicker mode on and off, and you have no shutter in case the flickering is so bad and you wanna go back to the shutter. So you're gonna see clips from two shows. One, like I said, where the lighting was 
okay in the background, but there was no front lighting. That was the starting line. And then the next night we had Walt Lafty and Nick Perry playing and the lighting was much better designed that night and gave me a lot of front light. So check out these clips right now and look to see if you see any flickering or banding. So there was a little bit of flickering in certain situations, but that's to be expected. And also, Steven shot the show with me and he was using the Canon R3 and ran into some flickering issues. It was very difficult to try and even with the variable shutter speed to get it locked in because the lights are all over the place. There's a lot of different frequencies floating around. Even when he flicked into the mechanical shutter mode, there were still some times where flickering showed up for him. I got it with the, the Z9 as well, but I didn't think it was terrible at all. So Nikon did a great job. They must have a really fast readout speed that it's not having an issue too much with the flickering. It wasn't to a point where I was like, nah, this isn't usable. Now there were some situations with certain colors and certain frequencies where I was like, yeah, this is gonna be a little bit more difficult, but I know that I used the A1 and the, Z and, the, and the A9 in the same venue, and I had a lot of trouble with those two cameras with flickering, even with the variable shutter rate, uh, and I had to switch with the A1 over to the mechanical shutter, and that worked out much better. But I had a pretty high shutter speed with the Nikon Z9 here and high ISO, and I think it did a great job when it came to dealing with flickering. Now, where I noticed some slight hesitation is with the autofocus. It again seemed to be bouncing around kind of like it was doing in the basketball and very similar to what it did in our pre-production model when we were photographing the boxer. It would be on the boxer and then it would be on something else and then it would bounce back to the boxer instead of staying sticky on the subject. We, we ran into the same issue with the Z9. Now, to be fair, when you don't have a lot of lighting in the foreground, lighting up your subject, it's gonna be hard and difficult for any camera. Steven ran into the same issue with the R3. So I'm not sitting here ripping on the Z9, just letting you know exactly what happened. Happened with the R3, happened with the Z9, where, but the Z9 was bouncing around a little more. It just feels like 
it was a little harder to, to, to stay on the subject. Sometimes it would bounce, even when it was better lit, to the guitar or back to the face and then somewhere else. And with Nick Perry having long hair, it would find his face and then if the hair got in the way, it would kind of lose it. But with Canon and with Sony, they seem to stay on the entire head longer and not bounce around and look for something else. I was happy with the results from both concert situations. I didn't feel like the Z9 was holding me up or holding me back from getting images that I would have gotten with other systems. I think it worked really well. And in fact, there's some great things in the Z9 that I wish the other systems had, like instant on and instant off. It is super fast and the sensor shield comes down to protect the sensor. So I can change lenses quickly and get back to shooting quicker than I can with the Sony's and the Canon's. That would work really well if, if Sony and Canon would adapt that or adopt that into their systems. That's something that Nikon did extremely well. But now what I wanna do is jump into the computer and show you some sample images so that you can see the results. And don't forget, you can download the full res JPEGs. I've uploaded them to Flickr like I used to do back in the day. There's a link down below, and there's also a link down below to raw files that you can open up right now and play with. So let's jump in to the basketball photos right here. So this is a good example. We, we have a subject that's flanked by out of focus areas, which is great. I'm using the 200 F2, really loved using that. Even with the VR1, I think it's perfectly sharp uh, and looks great. Now, remember, when you're zooming in on a 45 megapixel image, you may introduce some noise or grain at this, but that would be the size of a wall or a billboard. So th this looks great. Oh, and by the way, the lighting in this gymnasium was all over the place. You, If you looked up, you could see that there was white light, in the middle of that, in, in one sconce, there was a white light, there was a pink looking light, and then a white light next to it. So it was throwing different colors all over the court, uh, but I think it handled it, uh, itself very well. Um, the 200 F2, I just really loved using it. This looks fine, the colors are fine, the sharpness is great, that's a good basketball shot. These guys right here, this is also good, nice and sharp right on the eyes. What am I at? I'm at 3200 ISO, I'm at 1 2500th of a second at F2, nice and sharp. I don't care about noise or grain. These look like Nikon files and I love Nikon files. Uh, some more action shot, filling the frame really tight with the 200. Uh, you don't have a lot of, you can't zoom, so this is what you end up with. Let's look. Looks perfectly sharp to me in this case, so it did a, it did a great job adapted right there. A couple more here. Um, this one is good because it did not focus on the ball, right? Where we saw that sample image, uh, the sample video where it focused on the ball. In this case, it didn't. I also switched to the 70 to 200 2.8 VRS, which I think handled itself very well here, and I'm at now 4,000 uh, 4, ISO at 1 2,000th of a second. I like faster shutter speeds. Uh, being that we have the 120 frames per second mode, uh, it's not something I would use in concerts or for, ball, uh, for bald eagles or something, probably, but I switched over to it for this, and it's really cool that you can go through the sequence and pick out the one shot that you want. Now, it's only 3.4 uh, megabytes. It's an 11 megapixel image, but for sports shooters, you could do anything with this. Now, it's a JPEG, so just know that whatever settings you have set in your camera are gonna translate to this for your picture style. I still did tweak it a little after the fact. Um, that's what it looked like before, straight out of the camera, and this is what it looks like with some tweaking. But this is the 51-2 shot. Let's zoom in. This is where I was saying, like, I'm like, is it perfectly tack sharp? Is it like slightly out? And this is that situation is when you're looking at it, you're like, look, if I need to look that close to try and say whether it's perfect or not, then it definitely, it definitely is, especially when I'm zoomed in one to one. So I was really happy with how well it acquired this subject, how fast it was happening, and it did it. The, the Nikon did a great job. The Z9 feels great in the hands. It's, it's heavier than the other systems, uh, but it still feels really good. One of the things I would like to see tweaked is that Canon has the, what's that sensor thing called again, Steven? Smart controller. smart controller. I never remember the name of it. The smart controller is the best thing. I wish that Sony had it. I wish that Can, uh, I wish that Nikon had it. It's just in a better place than where the Nikon is for my thumb. It's just much quicker to move the focusing points. Not always a deal breaker, but just something I would like to see tweaked. Uh, for the basketball situation, for adapting lenses, to be able to use a, a 200 F2, 
uh, with the VR, uh, the, the F to Z adapter version two, it did really well in this situation. So I was happy with the results that I got with basketball, especially shooting at 1.2. Let me jump in here and remind you one last time that the super huge mega camera giveaway for 2021 is coming to an end. I am giving you a chance to spend $4,999 of my own money on anything you want at Allen's camera. That means you could put it towards a new Z9 and come up with a few hundred bucks more and bam, you would get it for 500 bucks plus tax, but it's completely free to enter. Head on over to bit.ly slash megafro2021 right now to get entered for free. And if you would like to purchase Fro Pack 1, 2, or 3, the triple play bundle, or you already own them, you will score extra entries just for doing so. But as a reminder, you do not need to purchase anything for your chance to win the grand prize. All right, let's get to the uh, the Conowingo Dam shots. This was interesting. You know, most people weren't going to photograph seagulls, but I knew if something was flying, I should take photos of it because I might not get an opportunity. I saw the, the, the seagull out of the side of my eye diving, and I missed it diving to grab something, but I caught the next couple of shots where it grabbed the fish and then dropped the fish. But that, the results are fine. Like, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. And I was really happy with this. I mean, this is one of those lucky breaks where you get the shape of the birds is a heart. Come on now. That's like one of those lucky breaks that you get. Nobody else was photographing this, but I saw a bunch of birds moving in unison and I thought it would be really good to do it. Now, I didn't expect the autofocus from a distance to lock onto the birds, like I said earlier, and it didn't, but it, it, found whatever it needed to find, and I shot the shots, and I got it. Not all were in focus, but this one is, and that's exactly what I needed. Again, happy with the colors, happy with the tones, love the Nikon files. Um, I guess this is a, a, a buzzer. I don't know what these birds are. Don't yell at me, I don't know birds, okay? Uh, I didn't crop any of this, you're seeing it full frame, so if something was flying overhead, being that only two eagles actually flew over the water when I was there in the four and a half hours, then you can you can take a look at this. This is the blue heron going across. Good shot. Subject tracking all the way through. Happy with those results. And the blue heron looks fine. Uh, what am I at? 1 6400th of a second. Some people may say, why were you so, at such a fast shutter speed? Because I was at such a fast shutter speed. I'm only at 64, uh, 640 ISO. Part of the reason is if you're photographing up in the sky, then it's gonna get brighter because there were clouds and it was a bright, morning and then when you dive back into the water i slow the shutter speed down instantly i did go into auto i steven i went into auto iso for a second and i realized that my iso and auto iso were fairly close but i didn't like what it was doing when it would go into the darker areas i didn't like that it was bumping the iso up much too high so i just stuck to tweaking my shutter speed Dial it down because the water's darker and I was happy with the results. Couple of eagle shots here. This was a juvenile eagle that decided to fly across the sky. And then we had a, a, a full on bald eagle going and flying. Not as close as I would wanna be. You could crop it if you really, really wanted. That's where you're gonna start to bring out imperfections. Oops, let me, let me switch this to lock. Let me hit reset, switch it to lock. And then you would come in. A lot of, oops, Jesus, come on, Jared. I don't know how to crop. That's why I'm messing it up. You just literally come in here and you'd be like, yeah, it's great. But of course, this would look great on Instagram, but if you tried to print it, we cropped quite a long way, you might run into some issues right there. Now let's jump into the first concert with the starting line. I love Nikon black and whites. Uh, I'm at 6400 ISO here shooting uh, the 51.2 at 1.8. I think now's a good time to jump in here and start to talk about that. I don't feel fully confident shooting the 1.2s at 1.2 in every situation. It worked in the basketball situation, thankfully it did, but I've also noticed that in some other situations, uh, the, the hyper-focus, the super tack sharpness, wasn't there at 1.2 for some of the situations that I was in. So I find myself dialing it up to 1.8 or 2 or 2.2 to make sure that it's extra sharp. But check this out. Let me, let me revert back to the original. You see this banding line right here? Um, I don't think it detracts from the image. 
uh, in the final result, but you can see that it's picking up that red wave, however it was picking it up. This is the result that I ended up getting. There's also no light in the, the only light in the foreground was not white. It was this amber color, which is not great. And 311 wasn't playing. Good one, right, Steven? That was good. That was a Steven loves 311. But anyway, I like how that looked. Um, see, I'm at F2 now, and it looked like we had ended up getting chin AF for this. Uh, the eyes aren't tacked, but at the end of the day, nobody's gonna notice it. Even if this was printed large, it's perfectly fine at 8,000 ISO. Um, this is just to show you the colors. Also, you're not getting the flickering or the banding in the background from these lights. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed. It was one of my major concerns with the Z9 and it's not really a concern. So I can say that not having that shutter, even in a concert situation, wasn't a deal breaker. So that's a pass for me, a pass in a good way, like it passed the test. So that's good. Um, no front light, but good shot. I'm happy with it, uh, not, not like, Color-wise, it's not perfect, because look at the face. And yeah, you're gonna see some grain when you zoom in here, but that's one-to-one. -one. We're at 8,000. I'm probably off by almost a stop. But look, this is where it started, and that's where I brought it back to. So really nice files. This is just to show you Steven was shooting in the pit. He had the R3 with the 70 to 200 and a bag of other lenses. Um, so I just wanted to show you that he was actually there. I went up on stage, I'm off by Almost a stop on this bad boy. But yeah, the, nobody ever shoots the drummers. But being that I could get up on stage and shoot the drummer, I'm happy with those results. I wish I could have gotten above the drummer. I did hold the camera up in a couple of pictures, but the lines weren't perfectly straight and I didn't get the crowd in there or anything. 12,800 ISO, off by a stop and a third. This is where it started. Oh, that's the blue that you get. No light backstage, because they didn't flip any on, just these right here. And this is usable, um, totally usable. 12,800, you could probably foot push it further. Don't ask me why I'm at 3.2. I have no reason, I don't know why I was at 3.2. I should have been at 2.8. That's a mistake on my part, but I was down to 1 2 50th of a second. I don't know why I was at 3.2. Next day, much better lighting in this situation. No banding issues here. Look at all the LED lights that are going. Better front light this time, really sharp. Really nice right here. Um, that's with the 14 to 24 is nice. Now this is with the 35 1.8. I'm at 2.2. Now I was at 2.2 because I feel that the S line of the, the 24, the 35, the 50, and the 85 1.8s, they're very good lenses. But what makes no sense is why they're called S line lenses when the 24 to 70, the 51 to the 70 to 200, the 14 to 24 are considered the same line when they're three or four times as much money. Also, they have multiple motors in those higher end lenses. Whereas the 1.8 line, they're good lenses, but they have a single motor, at least from what I read in the description, it says motor. So it's not as fast. And I feel that they do not get hyper accurate at 1.8. So I, I felt that that is a slight issue with those lenses. That's why I'm shooting those at 2.2 or F2 and not always wide open. But don't get me wrong, those lenses are very good, but they are slower focusing 1.8 lenses. They just can't keep up with the 2.8 speed of the focus or even the 51.2. And I bring this up because Sony has 1.4 lenses and 1.2 lenses and they're lightning quick. They even have 1.8 lenses that are lightning quick. Canon has 1.2 lenses. They don't have very many 1.4 lenses. If, do they even have a 1.4 at this point, Steven? I don't think they have a 1.4 RF at this point yet, but they're 1.2, they have 1.2s. Whereas I wouldn't use a 3518 if there was a 3512. I wouldn't use the 8518 if there was an 8512. So I'm just saying that the other systems are slightly fast, well, actually more faster with those lenses. And I just wanted to make a point that these 18 lenses are fine. They just aren't as tight and accurate as I would want them to be. But the colors are fantastic. Right, they pull great files. They help you get great files. This is where this one started. I added a lot more yellow to help bring out that purple um, and warm it up and 
God, those files look fantastic. Walt should be nice and sharp here. Thankfully, even though he's wearing a hat, there was light in the front, which made that better uh, than Nick Perry performed. I got right in front with the 14 to 24. Really happy with these results. Um, you know, with his hair, it's a little more difficult. This is the 51 2 at 1.8. The, the, the focus, it looks much sharper on the microphone but I think he's perfectly fine. Even though the microphone looks sharper, there's more detail. From a distance, this is great, right? I'm, I, I love the results that I got there. Uh, two people in the frame. This I wanted to show you because of the slight banding, you know, slight flickering that was caught. This isn't bad at all. By the next shot in the same sequence, it's just, it's just wherever those lights were at that exact moment, it caused this. And as soon as they moved out of the way, there was no other issue with them at all. And the last image to share with you is this one. I just wanted to show you again, a ton of light being thrown at the camera and no issues with the flickering at all. Nice and sharp with the 14 to 24. Like I said, that thing, those 2.8s focus extremely well. Now to wrap this up, let me give you some more thoughts. One of the issues I had, and this is just a minor issue, is that it's very hard to know when you're taking pictures, if you're in silent or it's super loud and you can't hear the digital shutter going off. The Nikon around the edge of the frame blinks white quickly when you're shooting. But that's difficult to see when you're focused on generally the middle portion of the frame and looking at your composition, you don't really notice that you're shooting. The only other way you can tell is there's a remaining number in the bottom right hand corner and you can see that remaining number going down slightly and then coming back up. That is so you know, that's one way you know you, you can shoot. There are, are other options you can turn off in the camera or turn on, like you can have it show a black frame, which defeats the entire purpose of having a blackout free shooting experience. The, Nikon's not the only one that has this issue. Uh, it's better in the Canon, and I think the Sony, I have some other issues seeing when I'm shooting there, but the Canon has a box that's closer to the middle of the frame that's basically in your sight line that you know you're shooting. Maybe one day we'll get like a watch that will vibrate through Bluetooth or in our ear, we can hear the shutter going off. That would be something good to have. But let me say this, if this was the only system I had to shoot with, I would be perfectly happy taking it out into the real world and getting results that I otherwise would have not been able to get with the Z6 or the Z7 because the Z9 just corrected so many things that those cameras didn't have right at the time. Uh, it just shows you that all the things that I've been saying time and time again about the Z6 and the Z7, Nikon knew and they got it much better and more correct in the Z9. I could take the Z9 and be happy using it. I love the 45 megapixels. If I had to choose between 45 and 24 of an R3, I'd rather have 45. With that being said, if I had to choose between an R3 and an R5, I'm probably leaning towards the autofocus of the R3, but amongst all of them, I'm still gonna stick with the A1 for now because it's 50 megapixels. It's 30 frames a second in RAW, albeit compressed RAW, the Nikon could do 30 frames a second, but it's only JPEG. And the Canon could do 30 frames a second, but it's 24 megapixels. So for me right now, the ranking is like, we got the Sony and the, and the Canon, you know, pretty neck and neck right now, and the Nikon has caught up, right? It's not far behind, it's perfectly usable. If you're a Nikon shooter with big ass glass or a bunch of glass, or you, you, you've been in the Z system already, I still say, if you can afford this camera, go pre-order it or go order it, because I guess you'll get it whenever they finally can ship them all, and you will not be upset with it. It passed the test that I was hoping that it would pass. The autofocus needs a little bit of tweaking, but it's still really good. The files, the raw files, great. The colors, great. The lens selection, will continue to get better. I want those 1.4s, I want those 1.2s, but at the end of the day, so far, so good with the Z9, being able to take it out into the real world in the first week to get two concerts, birds, and a basketball game, we're gonna be able to wrap up a real world review at some point. I wanna keep shooting with it, I wanna keep trying it more, but right now, happy with how the Z9 is handling. So thank you guys very much for watching. Jared, Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.